Well, hello again, everybody. I'm Dan John. Today, I want to talk about a topic. It's, it's really not actually my field, but obviously because if you're in strength and conditioning, uh, you're going to run into this all the time. I want to talk about diet and fat loss today. Um, the joke I always say uh, is uh, do it or diet. And it's corny and it's not very good, but there's a lot of truth to it. And I'd like to talk about that today on this workshop. The, the subtitles fat loss is the thing. And this leads us to how this the whole thing started. Not long ago, my friend Amy talked to a nutritionist and she said, the nutritionist said, at best, exercise is 5% of fat loss. Well, that's, that leads 19 out of 20 things for something else. And I think that's diet. Uh, we always say uh, fat loss happens in the kitchen. Um, but the other thing that went up, and it's happened at so many workshops I've given, is a bunch of hands will go up right at the end, and they'll start asking the same question. And of course, the question is, you never mentioned fat loss. Let's look at the workshop that this happened in most recently. This is my now what grid. And this is what I use for uh, coaching everything. So on this nice little grid you have there, there's four words at the top. Health, which I define as the optimal interplay of the human organs. Um, if your liver is livering, your kidneys are kidneying, you don't have any disease, you don't have cancer, uh, you're healthy. And you learn that by blood tests and going to a doctor, going to a dentist, going to an eye doctor. The next word there is longevity. And uh, longevity is a quality issue and a quantity issue. You know, you could live to be 150, but if you had a horrific life story, it wouldn't be that great. The next word there is fitness. And I, and I use Darwin's, it's the ability to do a task. And that's all it is. And the last word is what I deal with, and that's performance. Performance is when someone calls your name and then you step up and you perform, whether that's Broadway or singing or throwing the discus. To help people with those four quadrants, what's about to become quadrants, I have two things I want you to think about. One, if something comes up once or a few times versus something that's ongoing or permanent. And I... And, and you have to think about that because in some parts of our life, things come up that you only have to deal with one time. But other things like, for example, my, my training is a daily, day in, day out kind of thing. The two biggest terms I use when I, when I try to help people, now this can be fat loss or performance or anything in the middle, the two things I try to really focus on are shark habits and the pirate maps. The term shark habits comes from Rob Wolf. Very simply, one bite and it's gone. One bite and it's out. Yes, no. And on pirate maps, this comes from Pat Flynn. A pirate map is a very simple thing. <laughs> Go to St. John's Island, find the white coconut tree, take seven paces to the west, dig down and there's your treasure. I like giving athletes a pirate map for the next eight years of your life, <laughs> you find the white coconut tree and take seven paces to the west and just keep digging until you get there. But what's interesting is as simple as these two things are, they need a little bit of explanation. Both, by the way, are habit-based ideas. So the concept of shark habits, one bite and it's gone. Uh, you probably see this uh, when I do these online talks. I have 16 pairs of this exact same shirt. I, I never think about what I'm going to wear. As I note there, I have six pairs of barbell jeans. I look better in some of them than the others. That's skinny fit. Um, I have six pairs of Nike Freeze. And once you buy them, you realize that the word free is a funny answer. If any of you have ever emailed me, you'll notice that if I open an email, I answer an email. When I open my mail, I deal with my mail. If you're in my, inviting me to your wedding, I will check yes or no on the RSVP, I'll fold that up, I'll send it to you, I'll go online and I'll order your, your, your wedding gift right away, Shark Cabin. Uh, we have a shopping list for our home because we have a menu. Uh, we eat the same thing basically every single uh, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. We have a menu for each one of those nights and the shopping list reflects it. When the girls were little, little we all knew that white laundry was Monday. Dark laundry was Tuesday, bathrooms were Wednesday. 
This is shark habits. Once you start thinking this way, it frees up the brain. The laundry one's the best example. So if white laundry is on Monday and I walk by the white laundry basket on, say, a Thursday and I see it's kind of full, my mind says, that's a Monday task. So even though it's full, I can still ignore it because that's a Monday task. Now, you can go overboard on this. Uh, the Adams Family movie has a funny scene about old business and new business. But really what's nice about having this basic yes-no approach to things is it keeps your mind free for what's important. So let's look at these two and how they interact together. So everything that's not my goal, I try to shark habit as best I can. And then everything that is my goal, I try to put into a daily pirate map. And we'll get to mine in just a moment. But what I'm trying to get across here is if I do these basic same things every single day, day in, day out, on my pirate map, I will get my goal. And I'll tell you about the goal in just a second. But even if I don't get to my goal, I know that when the day comes to a close, you know, after the work day is over, my wife comes home, the, the dog is finished chasing rabbits or whatever my dog does all day. Then we sit around and we, we, we call it the land of live, laugh, and love. Every child I have, every godchild I have, we have a sign in the home somewhere that says, live, laugh, love. Because to me, as important as shark habits and pirate maps are, my time with my family, my friends, the people I care for, and there's always new people coming in, that to me is the most important thing in life. Let's look at a, a very basic uh, example of a pirate map. Now, this is one that can be used by anybody. In fact, it's not a bad idea at all. So every good day starts with a good night's sleep. So honor your sleep ritual. I really think it's important to build an effective sleep ritual. For me, I make coffee, uh, and then I take my supplements, um, and, and I also write down what I'm going to do on my to-do list before I go to bed every night. And the to-do list is just, this one here is a Ravenclaw notebook. Ah, pretty simple. Uh, and really, I just write down a couple of words just so I don't have to keep thinking about them. I have a podcast at eight. It's written down, I don't have to think about it anymore. Then sleep, and I gotta tell you folks, sleep is paramount. I, I think the hours before midnight are more important than the hours after midnight. I think you should go to bed within two hours of sundown. I think you should sleep in a cool room that's extremely dark, and I know that's not optimal for all of you. And then the day starts off when I call this fast and focus. So I start my day by always being grateful for a moment, and then I drink a lot of coffee. And then I do the system called the three E's, eliminate. And yes, that includes bowel movements and going, to ba going potty and all that kind of stuff, flossing, brushing your teeth, but it also means to take care of my to-do list. After that, I exercise. Uh, it can be fundamental human movement workout, sports training, uh, rucking, walking, whatever. And then after that, I try to eat like an adult. Protein, veggies, water. After that first meal, usually brunch for me, I try to, I try to knock down everything else on my to-do list if it's still around, or take care of business, or like I did yesterday, I just did general house chores for a few hours. And then I do a short little walk, and then I eat, and I just keep repeating that day. And live, laugh, love. Folks, the three E's is a marvelous way to schedule your life. Let's look at my slide. Uh, pardon me. Let's look at my pirate map. My, my goal right now is to dance at my granddaughter Josephine's wedding. She's six, and the people in my family don't live long. So I would like to live another 20 years or so. I'm 63. It'd be nice to be around to be in my 80s. Very few people in my family have ever made it. My brother Richard, at 75, is the oldest person we know in our DNA line uh, to live that long. This is the truth. This is real. So for me, I do my sleep ritual. I make coffee for the morning. I take my supplements. I make tomorrow's to-do list. I wake up, and I'm grateful. Thank you, Pat Flynn. I, I do a one-moment meditation. It's a app that's on my phone, 
and it's called One Moment Meditation. It's a one-minute meditation. Some days I go a lot longer. Uh, some days my meditation turns into a two-hour nap, and that's when I realize I'm probably kind of tired. Every day I do what, uh, Tim Anderson's original strength. Those are mobility sequences. And I do easy strength. Um, right now I'm doing easy strength for Olympic lifting, but and, and you can find that on danjohnuniversity.com. Uh, I ruck once a week, though it's funny that there, I've actually moved that now to twice a week. I do hypertrophy and 30-30 workouts as appropriate. And then this idea I got from Josh Hillis, I eat eight different vegetables every day. I try to, and sometimes, some days are easier and some days are harder. Uh, generally, by breakfast, I've already eaten all eight. I buy veggie packs as often as I can, and I mix them in every food I can think of. So... Why this is so efficient is because I always joke about the four F's. Fitness, finance, food, and friendship. Everything I just said there is true in just about every aspect of life. You know, if you do these little things often enough over the long haul, your health and fitness and maybe even your longevity are going to be a lot better. I know as I coach athletes, if I can get them to train an intelligent amount, every day for eight years. They're far better than trying to cram it into one or two week sections. Focusing on quality. Well, that's true of fitness, finance, food, and, and friendship. Uh, foundations first, master the basics. What's nice about my Shark Habit and Pirate Map concept is it gives you a kind of a formula to think about how to deal with all kinds of things in life. Um, I'm a big believer. I, I got learned this in personal finance courses. So I've always had all my savings and all my bill paying taken out before I get my checks. Uh, I built up a really nice retirement and never even noticed because I shark habited that thing. I, <laughs> and it was just a form and I checked the box and said, take 10% of my money for my retirement. And I never thought about it again. And I was able to retire at 52. Now, there is one thing about this I want you to know. Uh, this is a, a wonderful little uh, drawing I, I use a lot in my workshops. The peak, the plan, and the program problem. Everybody always asks me about program. Dan, give me a program. Teach me how to peak. Well, <clears throat> I love this because I have a little story. In the ninth grade, I told my sister, I want to go to Utah State University and throw the discus for Ralph Mon. And everyone thinks that it's that top picture there. But in truth, man, there were a lot of tough, hard times. And anyone who's ever gotten a goal that they set up in their life knows this to be true. Getting a goal is very difficult to do. That's just a little warning. Now, let's talk about the workshop. The hand goes up. Dan, you're brilliant. Thank you. But you didn't mention fat loss. Folks, fat loss is number one. Fat loss is the beginning of every sentence. Fat loss is the end of every sentence in fitness. It is the alpha and the omega of this entire industry. Art Devaney said it best. Lady raised her hand and said, Art, how do you get rid of fat? And Devaney famously said, don't get fat in the first place. Well, that didn't get over too well. Fat accumulation, and for those who are watching, uh, I'm going to read these for those who are listening. Fat accumulation is due to too many food choices, too many carbs, too many calories, and a business industry and body designed to want to eat more and more when food is available. You are designed to live and feast in famine. The problem is most of us have been living in famine not only for our entire lives, but our mothers, especially, and fathers, for, uh, whole lives. Yes, fat loss happens in the kitchen, yes. But there is an entire industry out there trying to get you to eat more and more and more. There is something about the smell of certain fast food that draws you in. You know why? Because it was designed by a nutritionist to make it draw you in. Fat loss is not a bunch of bird piece, a bunch of lunges and go for the bird. Fat loss is, and always will be, in the kitchen. Devaney was right, <laughs> and the audience wanted to kill him. 
Here's the issue. Many people tell us exercise doesn't do anything. And again, I'm reading for those of you who are listening. Members of the public are drowned by an unhelpful message about maintaining a healthy weight through calorie counting, and many still wrongly believe that obesity is entirely due to lack of exercise. Coca-Cola spent $3.3 billion on advertising in 2013 pushes a message that all calories count. They associate their products with sport, suggesting it is okay to consume their drinks as long as you exercise. However, science tells us this is misleading and wrong. It is where the calories come from that is crucial. Sugar calories promote fat storage and hunger. So before I get on, it is true, folks. Fat loss happens in the kitchen. Fat loss happens in the kitchen. But there's more to the story than this. And there's a little picture of me, for those of you not here, uh, when I was about eight. I am willing to admit when I'm wrong. Exercise is worthless for fat loss. Except it isn't. This is my number one belief as, as someone in the fitness industry. And I call this Fat Loss 101. It's not what you eat. It's what you ate. Universally, folks, well, I guess it could happen, but I have never had someone come in and just say, I woke up and literally overnight I put on 100 pounds of body fat. I've never seen it happen. It's not what you eat. It's what you ate that we have to deal with. And now we have to get rid of it somehow. This next slide, this, this is a very personal thing for me. I have two daughters and I grew up not only in the fitness industry, but I grew up in an era where television, movies, and now social media uh, makes it very difficult for uh, females to deal with their, with their bodies. And there's a lot of body shaming that goes on. And it's been an important thing as, a, as for me as a father and now as a grandfather. So what we're going to do now is drive over and look at the world of health, fitness, longevity, and performance and how diet and things like that can help. Well, for health, the most important thing you can do is your annual checkups. Go to the eye doctor, go to the dentist, go to the medical doctor. For the diet, <laughs> I say this all the time, I'll try to say it nicer this time, eat like an adult. You know, there's no need to have cartoon characters on, on your food. Uh, there's no need to have a, a clown sell you food. There's no need to have, to fall into all those gimmicks and all those things. Eat like an adult. Eat like an adult. For longevity, the do-it side of everything is kind of simple. Uh, it's believed that we only need about 100 minutes a week of exercise. Uh, I literally did that this morning in my workout. And somehow fasting seems to help with longevity. So some exercise, it's interesting, I've been talking about, people have been telling us for the last few years that exercise doesn't help with fat loss. But it really helps with longevity and fasting. It's interesting because we're talking about eating and not eating seems to be healthier in sometimes. Uh, wear your seatbelt and your helmets. Learn to fall and recover. And the thing I constantly tell people, don't try to be stupid. Don't say, hold my beer and watch this. Don't go out of your way to get hurt. Uh, we were watching this show uh, where uh, basically stupid human tricks and it's like, it's no wonder uh, some people always have high health care bills. Dick Notmeyer, when I was young, uh, he, uh, he told me that he thinks that longevity is 50% DNA. And from what I've seen in my life, that seems to be true. 40% lifestyle, you know, wear your seatbelt, keep an eye on your waistline. But 10% of it is luck. Um, you know, I grew up in a military family. Uh, seen a lot of things in my life. Uh, many of my child, nearly all of my childhood friends are dead. And some of it is just pure luck. And if I could just tell you one more time, don't try to be stupid. For longevity, uh, it does seem that eating like an adult is going to help out. You know, <laughs> eat your vegetables, eat your protein. 
uh, it is interesting, and I talk about this in, in other workshops all the time, that it does seem that red wine and coffee seem to have some magical ingredients in them. Uh, I feel it's not the fact that there's antioxidants in them or any or resterol. I think it's the social nature of coffee and red wine. A coffee break, uh, you're having a bad day and I invite you over for a glass of wine and we talk things out. It is really, really, it's that tapestry my friend Joe Cormier always talks about in life. I'm trying to build my friendships into tapestries. And of course, there is a very inexpensive drug uh, called metform. It comes from the French lilac, I think. It's been around for about 100 years now. And it helps control the type 2 diabetes. Uh, diabetes. Um, and there is some research going on that indicates it may even help with longevity. And of course, fasting uh, seems to help a lot with longevity too. When it comes to fitness, uh, what you need to do is be very, very task specific. Um, uh, I'm going to use a discus throwing example here, but it, we call this decision fatigue in the military and in sports. Basically, there's three kinds of uh, uh, techniques of throwing the discus. Well, if you start out month one doing one technique, month two doing another, and month three doing a third, because you keep reading new articles, you're going to get very com confused. For those of you who go online and look at things like, is coffee good or bad for you? You've got to have some, some level of decision fatigue. I don't see how people can even handle it. Uh, it seems like every day something is good and something is bad, and they flip the next day. Um, for diet, for fitness, eat like an adult. And that's, once again, what I was told at the Olympic Training Center. It's protein and veggies and drink water. It's that simple. For performance, then we focus only on principles. And the word principle is broken out into prim, prime, which means first, and simple is from the same root as capture, to capture first place. When I coach a sport, uh, it's number two, it's called embrace the obvious, but my principle-based coaching is based on the idea that runners run, hurdlers hurdle, throwers throw, jumpers jump, and if you have a team sport, you got to find out those things that make you win. For diet, honestly, I don't think it even matters in performance. Uh, you can eat really terribly and still perform at a high level. Yeah, after you retire, after something, you'll pay a price for it. Yeah, if it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. If it does, then make it matter. Like, for example, if you need to get down weight classes, like if you're a lifter or a fighter, then you better be smart about how you do things. So yes, for fat loss, exercise is only 5% of the formula. I'm about to uh, discount that. But it's also important for the quality and quantity of life. Make sure you understand that. So for just fat loss, which seems to be the only thing people want to talk about, exercise might not be that important, except you know it is. So two things. One, realize that it's not what you eat, but it's what you ate. And number two, Realize that fat loss happens in the kitchen. Let's just say those. Let's make those foundational and true, but let's defend exercise now. And these are two amazing studies. I'm going to read them off for those who are just listening. The subjects were healthy adults who normally walked about 10,000 steps a day. For two weeks, they had to limit their steps to 2,000, so 8,000 less steps then returned to their regular 10,000 routine. The results proved to be consistent, if worrisome. The volunteers almost all had developed what the scientists called metabolic derangement. Now that's a word you need to remember. Metabolic derangement. During their two weeks of being still, their blood sugar levels had risen, insulin sensitivity declined, Cholesterol profiles became less healthy, and they had lost a little muscle mass in their legs while gaining fat around their abdomens. Thankfully, most of these derangements were reversed once the men and women became active again. Okay, by itself, that's bad enough to hear. So they were walking 10,000 steps a day. For two weeks, they dropped to 2,000, and bad things happened in those two weeks. Two weeks. But, there's more. But... For unknown reasons, a few of the volunteers 
did not return quite the same level of exercise they had engaged in before. They now compete, completed fewer minutes of vigorous activity each week that previously, than previously and had some slight but lasting symptoms of insulin resistance even after the two weeks of moving normally. This is from the New York Times. In other words, some people, once they got on the couch, didn't want to get back up. And then a second study came out, which is really more important. This was for people over 65, but that's okay. Like the adults in the other study, these other volunteers quickly developed worse blood sugar control during their two weeks of barely moving. Insulin resistance climbed. Some developed changes in muscle mass, indicating that they might soon begin to lose muscle mass. Muscle tissue, pardon me. Some developed changes in muscle tissue, indicating that they might soon begin to lose muscle mass. And a few had to be removed from the study because they had edged in the full-blown type 2 diabetes after becoming inactive. So yeah, maybe fat loss isn't impacted by exercise, but lack of exercise leads to metabolic derangement. I want you to put that word to memory. Metabolic derangement. Why do I exercise? I'm avoiding metabolic derangement. That's powerful. Now, let's look at what we can do. Fat loss happens in the kitchen is true. It's not what you eat, it's what you ate, is truth. 95% of fat loss is nutrition. True. But in our experience, you need something else. You need some kind of caloric restriction, and not crazy, and what I call inefficient exercise. My friend Josh Hillis, who's an expert on female fat loss, he has taught me some very, very simple things. Keep a food journal, lift weights, and try to lift weights to get up to some kind of standard. I'll give those in a minute. And it's all about habits. And then I make a note here. Listen, it's habits. It's always habits. That's why the shark habits and the pirate map are so important. Here's a shark habit for you. When you go to the store, don't buy crap food. Don't buy fast food. So at the store, when you see cookies, don't buy them. Later on, you won't eat them. That's a shark habit. Uh, buy those vegetables. I, I buy the pre-made ones because, you know what, I know I'm too lazy to cut them up myself. Uh, I had an interesting conversation with somebody when I, they, they bought the, the, I bought the pre-cut peppers and they bought peppers. And their peppers, when they were finished, were a third of the size of my peppers. I actually get more peppers pre-cut than they did cutting them themselves. Not scientific study or anything, but it certainly shaves a lot of my brain pan. Fat loss. It's interesting because I have a program for gaining size called Mass Made Simple. And when people go on, I always get a question. I want to get bigger, but I also want to do uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and triathlons. Can I also do this really, really hard program? And I tell them, in my humble opinion, I think the hardest thing we can do as humans is gain lean body mass once we become adults. In fact, I think it's really difficult. I wouldn't say it's impossible, but it's really, really hard. And the second thing is fat loss. And yet, every time I go to a workshop, all I ever hear about is fat loss, fat loss, fat loss. And then finally a hand comes up and asks, you know, how can I get a bigger gun? <sighs> the two hardest things you can do. How do you go on fat loss? I argue two things. At some level, caloric restriction and some kind of inefficient exercise. Most people can't hear food or diet. I have a theology, religious studies, religious education background, and there's a word we use in that field called steno. It's when a word has just one meaning. Um, it, it's very difficult to understand it because it's so obvious. Um, I'm sitting here at my desk, and if we were on the beach and someone really attractive walked by and I said, 
that person is so desk, you would stop and go, I didn't hear you correctly. Uh, a word like bad used to be a stento symbol, and then it became bad, and then bad. So it has morphed from a stento symbol into something else. The word gay, uh, don me now or gay apparel, used to have one meaning, and now it has something else. The word diet, when you work with most people, has a single meaning. It means starvation and rabbit food. Um, I get this question over here all the time. Dan, just give me the perfect diet. And I'm like, what do you mean? Well, there's low-carb, vegan, Atkins, paleo, fruitarian, breatharian. That's what I do. I just breathe. Uh, maker's diet, bread for life. There's a million diets. And they all really do say different things. Well, to help clear up how I coach people, I started talking to nutritionists. And here's the advice I got. Look for what almost all diets agree on. Cut out sugar. Cut out cardboard carbs. Okay, If a carbohydrate comes in a box or in a bag, cut back on it. Um, <laughs> the joke I always use, it, if it can stay on your shelf for years, it's going to stay on your butt for years too. Get rid of Frankenstein fats. Fortunately, we're making real good progress on this. Uh, given a cow and a bucket and a YouTube video, I could figure out how to make butter. But turning corn into corn oil, into margarine, margarine, I would need a laboratory. I would need Frankenstein to do that for me. And the final one is eat colorful vegetables. I have yet to find a nutritionist who doesn't look at that list and go, yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. That's what I think too. Doesn't matter where you are, colorful vegetables, Frankenstein's fat, get rid of the carbs, cardboard carbs, and the less sugar. Now, uh, there are going to be people who raise their hands and say, oh, I'm, I'm a carnivore. Fine. But for the bulk of us, that's good advice. When I talk about diet, seriously, I mean, it's so simple. Number one, eat like an adult. Eat your veggies, eat your lean protein, drink your water. I like this one. I'm a big believer in training a fasted state. Um, and not, you know, it's interesting that I, I, I was at a workshop and someone just ripped this apart, but I think he trained a fasted state uh, for reasons other than fat loss. I like what it does to my, um, the way I see things uh, in hawking uh, with raptors. There's a word called Yerrick, and that's the way a, a raptor looks when it's hungry. And I tell you one thing, when I train hungry, I find the weights that I lift them because I'm focused, man. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's great advice, stay hungry after, you know. It's okay to practice being hungry. Uh, it's never been a very complicated or complex. Um, train in the fastest state, uh, not long ago, someone uh, said that they were angry because uh, they had invented it. Well, my friend Hippocrates once said to me, uh, obese people and those desiring to lose weight should perform hard work before food. Meals should be taken after exertion while still panting from fatigue. They should, moreover, only eat once per day and take no baths and walk naked as long as possible. That last part's a little strange. Uh, yeah, um, our good friend Hippocrates uh, told us, you know, two millennia ago, you know, eat once a day, work out, then then eat, you know, fast as long as you can. Um, Greg Rose does an interesting thing as using fasting as part as his rehab. Uh, there's a diet called the elimination diet, which I like a lot, um, where, and I'll read it off for the, our listeners. Fasting, by the way, for five days in a row gives some real insights to what goes down well for you. Uh, there are a number of people have told me how successful they were fasting for a day or two and then adding a food a day uh, for a while to see which foods they react the, you know, poorly or well or awfully or, you know. And it's not, you can really target it when you add that one food. Um, most of the time, keep it simple. Uh, Mark Halpern is a good friend of mine, and he uses this arrow with his clients. Um, 
basically uh, the arrow on the screen is going from your left to right. On the left is pizza, candy, soda pop. On the, on the right is veggies, meat, fruit, a perfect diet. And his whole point is this. Move to the right as far as you need. Your perfect place is a blend of health, lifestyle, and values. Um, and I make a note on the bottom. And usually it's people who haven't exercised or trained who think they can go all the way to the right, uh, all the way, <laughs> on the first day. And that's so difficult. By the way, I have found Mark's arrow to be a pretty good little thing. Trying to get myself uh, to eat to the right. It's a very simple phrase. But I do have a caveat here, by the way. My brother Gary is friends with the great uh, University of Berkeley uh, nutritionist uh, Bruce Ames. And he always puts this on the board on the very first day of his lectures. And for those of you who are listening, it says eat dot 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 die. And uh, let me just fill it in for you. Eat vegan, you die. Eat paleo, you die. Eat ornish, you die. No matter what you're going to do in nutrition, you're going to die. Uh, I have found that to be a very helpful thing because it's so heavy handed. I like it a lot when I'm working with fat loss clients. Uh, okay, we're going to die. Uh, it kind of all depends on what quality and quantity of life you want to have. The second tool I emphasize here is, of course, inefficient exercise. Um, and then I'll give you a hint on how we're doing it now. Basically, uh, if you can't dance, dance. If you're a terrible dancer, dance is going to be a great thing for you. If you, if I, I'm, I don't understand like Zumba or any of these things, but if the teacher says lift the step ball change, I will have no idea what she's talking about. And I'll look around, and I will take probably 75 steps trying to follow along what I think I just saw, where somebody who's got a great dance background goes, step ball change. If you can dance, don't dance. If you're a crappy swimmer, swimming is great. If you're a poor biker, bike. My bike weighs a whole bunch of pounds, and if I was to do a 100-mile bike ride on that thing, i got to tell you, that bike is inefficient. So... What you want to do is keep finding ways to keep yourself inefficient. I think the reason the kettlebell swing works so well is you work really hard. You don't go anywhere. It's really an inefficient tool. Um, so what I do for fat loss, and I'm certainly not, you know, I'm, I'm not perfect, but I like to do my complexes, get my, my strength work, and then I like to put on uh, ankle weights, I carry hand weights, and sometimes I carry a vest, and I go for a long walk. We call that rucking. Lift weights, get the heart rate up a little bit, and then I go for a walk. The hand weights, the ankle weights, make walking very inefficient for me. And I think that's going to scavenge up all those free fatty acids that I just popped open, lifting weights and getting my heart rate up. So for body comp, it's pretty simple. Cut out sugar, cut out carbo carbohydrates, get rid of Frankenstein fats, eat your colorful vegetables, and then for exercise, do something you're not good at and get better, then find something else and get better, then find something else. So for me, I keep trying to find new and better ways to uh, <laughs> be inefficient when I train, which is why I love complexes and circuit training and all kinds of things that are very inefficient versus, say, just doing one or two or three lifts. Finally, I just want to share my friend Josh Hill's experience. Uh, there's a couple things he's done in his career that I like a lot, and I told you I'd get to these. First off, when he looks at your food diary, he only does two things. He takes a red X, and he puts a red X through any cheat meal you have. And then he takes a green pen, he puts a big green check mark on protein. And what he's trying to do there is just let you visualize that, you know, it's kind of a simple eye candy reward system. You want to see a lot of green check marks. Uh, he told me one time, and I don't know if I have the story perfect, but he told me that he had had a woman who uh, did the food diet, which is very rare at the beginning, but she came in and she had 24 cheat meals in a week. 24 cheat meals a week. There's, I mean, you eat three meals a day times seven. That's, you know, that's a lot of cheat meals. 
But instead of saying, I want you to get down to three, he said, get down to 15 next week. Well, she walks in the next week with her food diary, plops it down on the table, and says, ha, only 13. Win. Win. Now, of course, she's going to slowly bring that down to, it's probably okay to have three cheat meals a week, 24. But I, I just think the way he handles food journals, food diaries, is brilliant. In exercise, uh, push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded carries, he doesn't believe in any traditional car classic cardio. Uh, he feels, especially for females, getting them stronger makes them leaner. Uh, in my experience, I have found the exact same thing to be true. And then finally, with women, he has a very simple standard. And he's told me this a few times, and it's, it's just fascinating. Women get to, be, get to be rock star hot when they hit these simple, they're simple but not easy tasks. Three body weight dips, three pull-ups, and either five reps with 60 kilos or 135 pounds, and either the deadlift or the squat. He told me universally women get to be rock star hot with those straight standards. So his idea is this, the food journal and getting up to the strength standards is what's going to make you what he calls rock star lean, which I thought was a, a very good point. So what I wanted to share with you today was just some current research and some insights, especially for the, the trainer and, and, and the individual, the general population person, about how what is the role of exercise and fat loss. And we do have, a, it, training does have a role. Exercise has a massive role in longevity, of course, now. But also we see now that exercise has a massive role in keeping, this, keeping us away from this thing called metabolic derangement, which I happen to love. So yeah, get your exercise in. Do your push, your pull, your hinge, your squat, your load of carry. Get up to a certain standard. Eat like an adult. And really most of your dreams will come true.